ex-wife's great uncle Albert lived up here, and we were coming up here to help him uh, divest some of his uh, art collection. And for just for fun, I mean, we were doing it on the side, just kind of doing a thing. He had all this great artwork that he'd been collecting all these years, and he was getting a little older, and we were trying to help him kind of make room for stuff. And uh, just started coming up here and really kind of fell for it and made, made some nice friends and stuff like that and thought, wow, it's affordable and, you know, it's a cool vibe and all that. Moved up here and it lasted about five years before it um, just started changing dramatically. <laughs> um, I still have good people up here. I still love it up here. I'm not, I'm not trying to be a jerk about it, but uh, it was funny how quick that changed. <laughs> and it always comes back to, it had a lot to do with, I think, New York Times and you know, and then COVID happened, you know. Yeah, so you, you had a nice little grace period in there where it was like exactly what you wanted, but not quite cool enough to have everybody moving there. Exactly. And uh, there's, I don't know what everyone's coming up here for actually now, but, cause, you know, it hasn't changed all that much. It's not like there's suddenly a, a, a basketball team or, a you know, a venue of note, <laughs> really. So it's like it's like all the people, but without the kind of the I, I guess the culture in the same way you would get in a city. Yeah, yeah, and it's close enough for them to go back and forth and have their weekend houses up here, I suppose. Yeah, I, I honestly I think that's the big thing right there. It, it, you know that you could always like commute back into the city if you need to. Hey, where where are you? Where are you from? Where am I catching you from? Uh, I'm in Queens, so I'm not oh, I'm not that far from you. Yeah, I'm in Astoria. Oh, my buddy Jesse Mellon is from out there. Yeah, I'm, I'm from California originally, but I've been out here for like like 15 years at this point. Right. That's what I was wondering. I saw Riverside. I'm like oh, Riverside is it like Riverside, California? Second mm. person asked me that today. <laughs> Ooh, that seems to be a thing. In terms of like, in terms of the culture question, I mean, is there much of a, is there much of a music scene in Hudson? A need for it? Um, nothing specifically. Nothing like, uh, you know, any one kind of scene really. What we do have up here that um, we have the want and the need for it, and we have a few outlets for it. Like we have um, the Park Theater, which is just across the street from me, that brings in some cool stuff. Like we had Corey Glover up here randomly twice now. Um, he came up and sang with like kind of a kind of a more of a kind of a bluesy pop band, but like did you know did a lot of cool stuff, covers and stuff like that. It was really great, and I had never seen him before play even with Living Color or whatever. But man, he was fantastic. It was really a great show. Um, just funny enough, out of the blue, and you know we get the Basilica up here, which is. Uh, Melissa Oftemar's, you know, nonprofit that her and her husband Tony run, and they bring in some cool, you know, acts and different things once in a while. Um, and people come from out of ta- out of town; they come up from other places to see those shows. But yeah, there's not like a venue venue up here. There used to be Club Helsinki, but that hasn't come back since COVID because um, uh, it's just so many places have shuttered, you know. Do you end up playing around town? I mean, do you, do you try out new stuff in front of live audiences or anything like that? I, I used to with, um, with Helsinki. When Helsinki was here, um, it made sense. And I would go to open mic night. I'd try new songs out of open mic night just for fun. And that worked out good. But there's nothing really since then, sadly. Um, and, it lo- and it doesn't seem to be that that will come back. I think the... the um, I'm not sure if it's going to open back up as Club Helsinki, but the building is, I think, is about to be about to change owners and all this stuff. It's nice that you have a uh, you have a studio, so it's probably like not too hard to get people to come out to you when it comes to you know playing and recording. Yeah, you know it's easy enough because we're on the Amtrak line, so you know works out. It all works out. Do you miss city life at all? No, I do not. Pardon me. I do not. You know, I'm close enough to it and I have to go and I have to play them enough where I see plenty of city life. And I grew up in the city. You know, all my years in, uh, 
you know, I spent, you know, my youth in Minneapolis and grew up and spent, you know, 20 years plus in L.A. You know, good enough. As I said, I'm in Queens. Um, you know, Queens was like the epicenter of the world for COVID when it first hit the States. And there were definitely a lot of moments when I was wondering what was keeping me in the city, you know, certainly at that point, like I wasn't leaving my apartment. I was paying like New York city rent. It didn't make a lot of sense, but Hudson at very least Hudson seems like a really good place to ride out a pandemic. Well, kind of, (laughs) kind of, um, it was okay. Wasn't great, but I don't think it was great for anyone, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, for me, it kind of it made me hunker down and work on finishing this record. That was the one, the one good thing it did was it made me go to work, focus a bit. Uh, my studio was only, you know, literally three blocks from where I was living. That worked out. That helped. You know, we Chip and I would go to the studio and just wear our masks, <laughs> hang out. Do that kind of thing. In a normal non-pandemic year, is it is it hard to find the time and, and I guess the discipline that it takes to really start writing in earnest? You know, I was talking to someone about it recently. I think uh, in general, um, I haven't. I, I've I kind of toil with it because I, I I tour a lot, and then when I get when I when I get tired of doing that for a while, I have to kind of just get off the road and kind of you know kind of pull myself back and kind of think on it and and as soon as I get bored with that that's when I kind of focus on stuff and it would it doesn't really matter where I'm at when that happens it just matters that I have a certain amount of time after performing and doing shows and stuff like that where my brain kind of gets into okay what's next what are we going to do now what do we got over here grab the guitar you know um which is kind of why, you know, kind of how the pandemic kind of helped in a way in, in that I've been touring a lot and doing different things. Um, and then when the pandemic came, it just kind of had nothing to do really except kind of just suck it up. And we was forced more to finish what I had rather than be creative. It wasn't a creative time for me necessarily. I know a lot of people that got creative during that time and, and wrote, you know, made records and stuff like that. It was more kind of the utility, the utility part of making a record, which would be finishing it, you know, and getting, you know, <laughs> getting it to completion um, as opposed to like the writing process, you know. I was really jealous of people who were like, you know, like writing a novel or, or finishing an album during that time. I was... I, you know, I, I don't know if this applies to you too, but I, I, I think I was just too depressed. Like, it's really yeah. hard to like get into that head state when you're just under a cloud all the time. I had that completely going on, and I had both my kids in my two bedroom apartment with me, and my girlfriend at the time, and it was just kind of like, well, <laughs> wasn't a whole lot of room to think. Really, um, it was fine. It was good that we were together because we all we weathered it pretty well together, but. You know, at the end of the day, I think it, uh, you know, it was a crushing time for a lot of relationships in, in every way, you know. Uh, did music play a role for you in terms of, I don't know, I guess getting you out of that head state? You know, probably so. It gave me something to look forward to when things were starting to loosen up a little bit. God, it's such a weird thing to even to, to sit and go. That that really happened. <laughs> that really, that that time in my life really, really sucked and had nothing to do with me making it happen. <laughs> it's like that time in your life, like all the shit we make happen and we screw up and we make our lives stink in a certain way. That wasn't one of them. That was one of those ones that came. Someone else happened to make that happen. And I was like, wow, so weird. You can accept culpability for your own mistakes, but pandemic, you just got to suck it up. It's funny because there are like, there are years that are just like blurry and fuzzy, but that's, you know, from your own, from your own doing. Yeah, exactly. 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 I, I, do you find generally during, during the songwriting process, I mean, when you really are getting, I guess, down to brass tacks that there is kind of a lot of, 
a lot of banging your head against the wall? No, not really. I mean, when I when I get down to focusing on stuff, I can I can I can get done pretty much what I need to get done in a in a in a reasonable amount of time without killing myself about it. And I don't hold I don't hold on to things I don't hold things too precious. I mean, I I get inspired and I work within the inspiration, you know, and 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 move that to production and kind of you know make a thing happen uh, and and turns into a song or or whatever and yeah not a whole lot of banging my head against the wall it's more of a um what does this song need what is this what is what is it asking for here yeah i mean it's hard because obviously like you you can't or at least don't want to force it if you don't have to yeah no i've never really i mean the only time i've ever forced it is when i have like a writer's block when i know that it's been too long since i've written anything and life has kind of Life has gotten to be too much of, you know, there's too much life and not enough creativity going on. Those those moments happen. And there's, you know, when I, before I made my last, before I made the last Bash and Pop record, actually, the, before I made my last record, which was that Bash and Pop record, I actually went to a kind of a spell where I thought, well, oh, shit, I'm really having a hard time here. I should, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make myself write a song a week at the very minimum, and I'm going to go play it at open mic night. And that'll at least get me out of my head, out of my space, because I was going through a nasty divorce and all this stuff. And so it, it, making myself do that under those circumstances worked out really well. And I finished the record, and you know, the people that bought it really liked it. And so you know, it seems like that was a good thing to do. I haven't had to do that since then, because I've, been, um, I've had more room, and I've had, you know, been, my life's, life's been a bit lighter than then in some ways, you know. In that specific instance, when you're going through something real heavy like that, that's obviously affects every aspect of your life, does that does that end up making it into the songs in some shape or form? Life in general makes it into my songs, whether it's... A lot of times it's not even, you know, on purpose or anything of that nature. It's usually just sort of... Um, I, I, I write inclusively, like when I when I'm sorry, there's a car outside my door just going off right now. City life, man. Yeah, you know, I, I write I write in a way where I you know I, I don't write specifically about me. I, I I might be the impetus of the the song title of the the song coming, but I usually I include many vignettes within that if I as I as I write um, little things from. You know, it's like taking a snippet from each movie that makes you kind of is, makes a different movie kind of thing. Um, it's kind of that's kind of how I work. So I don't really, you know, write too uh, too poignantly in that regard to include any one person. I like to try and keep it to includes everyone. Everyone's fucked up in this song. <laughs> in that specific case, you were. It, it sounds like initially that 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 the divorce was a bit of a block, but ultimately that it allowed you to sort of throw yourself into something in order to kind of not distract, but in order to focus on something that wasn't that terrible thing. Yeah. 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 Of course. I mean, lucky me that I was able to, to take care of both things at once and then, and, um, you know, live through it and, and make a record out of it. Not that the record had anything to do with it, but, um, Probably certain parts of it, maybe. One of the big upshots of like having most of this written, it sounds like most of this was written prior to COVID, is that it didn't end up being a COVID album, which is like the last thing in the world I think people want to listen to, you know, in 2023. <laughs> yeah, no, most of this stuff. So most of this record definitely was written before COVID. It was finished during COVID, a lot of it. But we started this record in Austin, Texas, um, recording the first five songs with John Doe in a studio in Austin probably six years ago. Um, six years or more, in fact. And and kept kind of building on it as we went along because I put both myself and Chip, my writing partner in the Cowboys and the camp, Campfire, he and I both had, you know, we'd get together, you know, when I was between tours or he was between stuff and we'd, you know, work on stuff together and, you know, kind of did it at our, at our own pace. 
So it took a while to finish a record's worth of material, but, you know, we were touring around in between all that as well um, and just doing different things, different projects here and there. And, and yeah, I, I can imagine what it would have been like to try and write a record during COVID because, man, it would be very, point, it'd be very pointed towards those days and feelings about COVID, and I wouldn't want to do that. You know, in an album like this that was that was really kind of spread out in that way or, or recorded in some sense over a number of years, is it does it end up being difficult to make something that's really I guess cohesive on record? Not really, because for me I don't I don't I, I don't really aim to make a record of any sort. You know, I don't I'm not trying to make a pop record, a punk rock record or a you know, jazz record, if you will. I, I, you know, I just, the songs kind of dictate where the whole thing's going to go. And, and I let it, and I just kind of let it, you know, blossom the way it's going to, the way it's going to blossom. So I think it, it has the process of what becomes a record has more to do with how Chip and I write together. Uh, as opposed to you know what you know what we wanted it to be like or what kind of record we wanted to make or any of that stuff. So the cohesion it just kind of comes from. I made so many records so many different ways, and I've gone back to square one in a lot of ways as far as like the way we way I record. Like I, I in the early days when the replacements were making records, we would go in the studio, bash out the record pretty much um, you know live with vocal overdubs and a few stuff after that, a few things after that. But really, the idea of, like, getting, you know, the very minimum, the basic tracks kind of in a live setting and not spending a lot of time, you know, beating the songs up in the studio atmosphere. Um, I've gone back to that because uh, over time I've learned that, you know, you get diminishing returns once you've gotten the, you know, the the excitement of a new song on tape or what have you once you've gotten the initial thing recorded whether it's just the whole song or just their basic tracks at the beginning of the creation of the song really you're catching their best bit it's like yeah and i and it's so much so so like i can't imagine how you know you hear stuff you know about the stones making a Jumping Jack Flash, like the 150th take of that was the one that we've all come to know and love. And I just can't imagine sitting there spending that much time in a studio, which is maybe why the Rolling Stones are so successful and I'm not. But, you know, that's another story altogether. I couldn't do it on the, the bandwidth for it. And I think that uh, I've, that's the way the replacements did our best records. That's what my formative years were kind of like. And I kind of went back to that with this record because... Um, when we recorded with John Doe down in Austin, we did um, we did the song "Hey Man," "Fall Apart Together," "Karma's Bitch," um, um, "We Ain't." We did those live with him in the studio, and the vi- the vibe was really good. It was really fun. Those those were the the beginning of that record. That was the thing we were working off of, and how to, and that the rest, the rest of the record kind of had to work within that and be sim, uh, similar only in the vibe of how we were recording it with you know kind of live atmosphere. So a lot of the stuff was re, is recorded live, mostly um, even vocals and stuff in a lot of cases. That's because I just want to capture them um, while they're still exciting to play and exciting. You get your best bits that way. It's it's funny that you use the Stones as, as an example because I feel like there's a lot of people who would use Chinese democracy as kind of one of the ultimate examples of something taking a really really long time to get right. And and you know, uh, fair enough, fair enough. I mean, it took forever to make that record, but it also had to, it also had a different factor involved in that, and that is Axel trying to make a new record. With eight guys or whatever, however we were, six or eight of us, I can't remember now. So many people involved in trying to get us all to, you know, pool what we brought to the table together to make a cohesive record. So you got all these guys from different backgrounds and different, that bring different things to the table. 
to make that happen was a, was a major undertaking. It was one of my favorite takeaways of making that record and being in Guns N' Roses was just that it, had, it forced me to write with people that I would have nev- never even probably been in a room with before for one reason or the other, but maybe write with them. And what we came up with, I think, is a great record. I, people aren't going to love it or not because it's not like, you know, it's not, it's not like Sweet Salamine and all that stuff. And people, you know, want to keep you in a box and want you to make more of that same kind of record because that's what they really like the most about you, um, which is unfortunate in pop music in general. But, you know, all things considered, we made a great record. And that part of the process of working with all those different people and learning how to come up with that record from different backgrounds was really a really great thing. And that all... The one, the one person involved in this whole thing that never gets credit for it, and I don't think he even really wants the credit, to be frank f- with you, is Axel. I mean, he put that together. He produced that fucking record. You got all these producers that came and went that were part of being that, that part of trying to make that record happen. Like, you know, like trying to corral a bunch of retarded kittens, you know, that kind of thing, uh, and make a record out of it. That's kind of what the producer was doing, but Axel was just trying to get the best songs, and so. You know, when you're, when you're him and that's what he had to deal with and do to make his record and continue on, that's what we did. I think another reason probably why there was some negative reaction there is because once you pass a certain amount of time that you're working on a threshold, you're kind of like dooming yourself, right? Like the, the anticipation for it gets to a level that you couldn't ever possibly live up to. Yeah, and there were there were a lot of factors involved that really kind of were unfortunate in the making of that record that had nothing to do with Axel or me or anyone in the band. They were record label and management issues and outside forces kind of screwing up the works a lot. I mean, there was a lot of that stuff in there. And you got to remember, what he was trying to do was pretty extraordinary in its own. Those guys all quit the fucking band and left him sitting there. He's like, I ain't quitting. I'm fucking, I'm fucking going on. And that's why I joined the fucking band. I was like, that's the most punk rock thing I've ever heard. Yeah, I'm in. Let's do it. You know, it felt like, it was like, okay, one for all and all for nothing, you know, or what have you. Or fucking take over the world, whatever it was going to be. But it was, a, that was kind of the mindset going into that. I I look back on it very fondly and, you know, glad I did it. Not a regret in my body about it. Yeah, so, I mean, in a sense, it was part of the thrill was throwing yourself into an incredibly difficult position. Totally. I mean, that, totally. I mean, I'm all about the underdog, um, and I've always fought with, with alongside of, because... I've always been the underdog, you know, and I and uh, have the fight in me and the fighting spirit. I would say that's sort of like the underlying. Definitely, de- definitionally, that's what the replacements were. Is 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 the ultimate underdog Thanks. band, and one that like, you know, one, one that maybe didn't make it a whole lot of sense on paper. I mean, you're out there like, you know, eleven, 11 to fifteen years old starting out. I mean, it it must have been a must have been a weird thing to see for the first time. From the outside looking in, I would think so, but because I was in it, that was normal to me. I mean, if you think, when I look, when I look back on it, and, you know, I got a 15-year-old daughter right now that's playing softball game right now, in fact, <laughs> I'm missing. But uh, um, it's funny to, to imagine being 15 again or to even look back on it. My, when I was 15, I'm playing clubs already and, you know, making records, uh, a strange, a strange um, way to grow up. But, you know, it's all I know. I was reading in an interview that you did fairly recently, and you're, you're talking about, like, t- two, big, two big reasons why you started playing were, one, to, to be close to your brother, which obviously, you know, the band afforded that, but also that it kind of, like, I think you said that it kept you out of trouble, which was very funny to read, because, like, ultimately... Like that works until it doesn't, right? That that works until like playing music ultimately invites a whole new kind of trouble in. Well, yeah, I mean, it kept me kept me out of jail to, to one on one way, <laughs> in one way it did. Um, 
Right. And that's, you know, that's why my mom was able to sign off on, you know, me dropping out of 10th grade and giving guardianship to our manager, Peter Jesperson, so I could travel and tour. And, you know, she, in her mind, she was thinking, well, maybe he's got a career at this. Maybe this will be the thing, you know, that keeps him from, um, you know, committing armed robbery or ending up dead, you know, that kind of thing. So it really was, that's kind of where things were at with all that. Were you heading down a bad path prior to all of that? You were still very young at the time. Yeah, you know what? I'd I'd already been arrested three times by the age of, by the age of ten. You know, I was pretty much headed down a pretty dark slope there until my brother showed me how to play bass. So ultimately, like no regrets to having started that early. No regrets, man. There's no point in them. They serve nothing. I was uh, I interviewed Jerry Harrison recently, and I and I asked him because you know he had been. He, he had been in a band with Jonathan Richmond, and then he was in a band with David Byrne, and I asked him, you know, what it was like going from, like, one very strong personality to another, and, and as we're talking, it dawned on me that you did something, you did something very similar, you know, you went, you went from Paul to Axel, who are just these very, like, singular characters in rock music. Yeah. What's the matter with me? Jesus. <laughs> Probably in both cases, you know, the the, the Mats, because you were fairly young at the time, but Guns N' Roses, because, like, again, Guns N' Roses was very much a- Axel's project, that there's a certain sense of, like, kind of hanging on for dear life and, like, you know, letting the other person sort of s- see their vision to to its end. Yeah. I mean, the one the one thing... You know, and all this, you know, when, when, I, when, I, when I made that leap with Axel, the one thing I, I learned about pretty quickly with him is that he totally has your back. I mean, there's, there's no one that, um, you know, if, if, uh, if you're going to be in a band with someone and you, you know, want to commit to them, that's the guy you want to be in a band with because he's the guy that, Okay, if you're in the trenches with him, you know, when someone comes for you, he's going to be right there to fucking knock him out for you if, if you need be. I mean, he's, he was that guy that kind of gets your back, I guess, the best way I could put that. There are probably also, like, certain transgressions that, like, in hindsight that you're able to forgive with people, you know, in terms of, like, their placement specifically, because, like, obviously you were significantly younger, but everybody was so young at the time, and you know, and caught up in this like very specific time in the music industry. Um, I, I guess was that, was that part of the reunion being able to sort of go back and make it all water into the bridge? Not really. Cause when, when we broke up, we, we walked away from the replacements together, Paul and I, and just, you know, w- you know, we stayed friends. I mean, for all practical purposes, we never had a, never had a major rift or anything like that. We just kind of, left it there, left it, they were moving on to do other things, and when we broke up, that was, we both were already starting other, other things right out of the gate, I knew, I knew, and I think we all did, I don't know, and I think Chris even probably would have, would admit this as well, when we were going in to make all shook down, it was, it was apparent that Paul wanted to do some other things, and wanted to get some other textures and sounds and had some other ideas going on that seemed like almost that he wanted to produce the record. And just the way he talked about it, the way we kind of went in it, I, I was completely open to that uh, from the moment I, you know, it came to be realized that that's what he was kind of aiming to do. But at that, at that point too, I was already starting to write, you know, the, the first bash and pop record and all this. So, you know, when we by the time we walked away from it, we were both kind of already kind of looking at the future and doing different stuff. And you know, he would come to LA and call me up to come play in the record or hang out. And you know, when he was in the studio and stuff, which I would do because he's you know he's like a brother to me, always has been. And um, you know, and the reunion thing was just more like, okay, so we left it, <laughs> we left it for a while, Let's give it a little visit and see what's going on. I think. I think uh, the only sort of downside was that I think we kind of overstayed our welcome a little bit. I think for what 
what it takes and what it means and the weight of it all, of being the replacements and all that. I think we had fun with it to a degree, and then I think maybe we should have maybe not done it as long, I think. My takeaway from that, it's one of those things I think it's good to to visit once in a while, maybe in a short spurt while it's fun and, and exciting and then not, you know, not, not watch the whole movie. What is the weight of being in the replacements? You know, just, I don't really have it myself. I don't have that, that having to compete with my, you know, with my replacements past. I don't have that. Paul was more the songwriter in that regard. I think that maybe the, the, he's got more of t- that to compete with and to, you know, come to terms with it, it, as far as um, uh, living past the legacy, that kind of crap. I don't, I don't really ponder it. I really haven't. I kind of feel like I've, I've been lucky enough to do all the things I've done since we broke up. All the twists and turns of my life has taken and all that stuff have been interesting at the very least. <laughs> The weight of that is just really that, you know, we're not that anymore. We're not, we're not the, the, even the mindset of the replacements, which was, you know, we've, we've grown up and grown out of, you know. And, and that's a good thing. That's, you know, um, no point in holding on to the past. Shit, there's so much stuff to still do. I mean, heck, I just, we just, we're put, just getting ready to put out this Cowboys and the Campfire record. June 2nd, and I'm already in the studio working on other stuff, you know, I'm already kind of moving the ball forward. Not that I, you know, I'm, we're going to be touring a lot behind this this year, but, um, you know, I've already, I'm already, my mind's already moving on to other things in that regard, because we, we did the record, and we've, you know, we've completed the task and, you know, put our best foot forward with it. You had earlier alluded to this, this period of this, I guess, this like refractory period of having to kind of cool off after tour before you were able to start writing again. I was going to ask whether that's gotten longer or shorter as you've gotten older, but it sounds like you're, you're, you're ready to just keep throwing yourself into the project. Yeah. I don't, I don't need a lot of time in between things to, to kind of catch my breath. What happens usually with me is I get out, I tour listening to music, in, in you know inputting all kinds of you know outside stimuli from you know other music you know all that stuff and then I get to a period where you know when I get off the road and okay you know I'm gonna take a break for a while um and then you kind of you get antsy you know you it, you can spend a little time you know relaxing and dealing with life and being a dad and all this stuff and then after a while you get a little you know, the creative juices start flowing and you start getting antsy for the creative process again. And I'm grateful that I have it. I mean, it's, it's one of those things. I, I can't imagine my life without having those creative um, spurts where suddenly it's like, hmm, I, I, I think I'm going to go look at the studio now. And I might, you know, grab my guitar and it's like, start humming along and playing some chords and soon you're plugging it in. If I can howl at the moon, you're, you know, coming up with something and just kind of taking, you know, taking your mind another place. It's like, I don't spend a lot of time in between enough to where those influences that have happened over the time before I calm down, before the creative juices start up again, they have to, that's, you have time to kind of clear the slate. You know, before you start again, I don't take a lot of time to clear the slate. I kind of clear it out, let it sit for a little bit, and then I kind of get, I get antsy. I talk to a lot of cartoonists, like people who draw graphic novels on the show. And, you know, those things, like, if you're lucky, that it, it'll take you like three or four years. And there's this, there's this really depressing thing that they do, which I think probably a lot of people do, which is at a certain point, you start like quantifying how much time you have left you know how many more of these things if you could break break them down by three or four years you you have in you i mean obviously and i I spoken to you know older musicians considerably older than you than you are um and i think that that ends up being it could be two things that can either like 
uh, paralyze you or that can be a motivating factor realizing that like at very least at a certain point there's certain stuff you can't do anymore and at a certain point like your body maybe can't really take a tour anymore i ponder it a lot i especially now i ponder it now i mean i've shit had a <laughs> i got a new hip in january you know because my hip was blown out you know you think about these things and honestly it doesn't um it hasn't made me step on the gas and go, oh, gee, I gotta, gotta hurry up because my life is coming to a quick end. Um, I, I, I can't say I don't think about that once in a while, though. It does, it does occur to me once in a while that, well, life is short, and it is short. And you have to make the most, most of it while you're here and in it. And, and, I, and I do do that. Like I said, I... I, uh, you know, we just finished this record. It's coming out in June. We're going to go start playing shows, but I'm already, you know, I'm starting to think of some other stuff, whether it becomes a, another Cowboys record or it becomes this side or the other thing. I don't know. I don't think about it because I'm, because of my, because I got a new hip or these other things, um, um, necessarily. Not yet. How does getting a new hip affect your ability to, to tour um well man it, you heal up really quick from them for one um miraculous a miraculous thing i i would have never i was mortified at the thought i came home from spain came home from spain and my hip was really hurting and my doctor said well here's what your x-ray looks like there's the, the right side and there's the left side this side still has some cartilage in that little joint there. And see over here, there's nothing really there. And I'm like, well, shit, that hurts. And because of the window of time that it happened in, my options were, he said, some people can live with this for like years before they just absolutely have to have it done. And some people just get it done. And so I was thinking, well, let's check it out. So I lasted about a week and a half, two weeks before I was thinking to myself, well, this really fucking hurts. And so if it really hurts now, if I'm going to have to have it replaced, I might as well do it now while it's the Christmas holidays and that stuff so that I'm ready to go when I want to get back on the road and spring comes around because who wants to be sitting on their ass in summer? Not me. <laughs> so I got it done right then thinking, yeah, it'll be healed up by the time I got to go out and put a record out and you know start touring. And that's exactly what happened. So it healed up pretty quick. Here I am, you know, ready to go. We leave on the 31st for our start of what's going to happen all year round. How does that happen? I mean, is that something that you, like, you exacerbate through lifestyle? Or is that just something that, like, just happens to people at a certain age? You know, I, it, it runs in our family. We have arthritis stuff, um, different things like that. Probably didn't help that I've been jumping around on stage since I was 12. The Guns N' Roses years definitely didn't help with that. You know, playing three-hour sets and then dragging your luggage through, you know, the Tokyo airport, you know, the next morning uh, for, you know, months on end, that kind of stuff. Not great for your body anyway, but for all the, you know, all the glamour and glitz and all that stuff, sitting on your ass on a plane for... You know, sometimes 22 hours, if you're, say, going to Australia or something like that, um, is really hard on your body. And, and to do that for years and years on end takes a real toll. And with my ge genetic background, all that stuff, you know, uh, harder. So I got a new hip. And my hip's great. So now I'm ready to go out and play for y'all. Do the thing. I mean, you know, you, sa you said what, basically like a year's worth of shows coming up. Mm-hmm. Pretty much. I mean, I'll be touring on and off until I'm dead, no matter what. Because, you know, I, I'm lucky enough that I can do it, and I still like I like it. I like playing in front of people. I love writing, and I love recording. So I, lucky me, I get to do all this stuff. Um, that's about the best takeaway of it all. It's like, you know, I get to do it. It's wild, right? Because, like, how many people do you meet in your day-to-day -day life who are basically doing the same thing they were doing since they were, like, 11 or 15? Yeah. I don't meet, meet a lot. Exactly. Um, yeah. There was never a point when it felt like, you know, 
I, I want to try something entirely different? You know, I've I've done different things, but you know, ultimately, I'm in a kind of a good spot right now. I produce I produce baby bands, and I you know I love that. I mean, I love. I just had a band, young kids from Connecticut called the Freedom Rockets. They um, they're 15 year old kids, 15 to 23. And, you know, they're still, you know, they're still, you know, living through their dad's record collection. And, you know, it's, it was a really fun record to make. And so I get to do that on the downside and, you know, when I'm not touring and healing my hip, you know, I did that. I did that just, I started that project before I went in for surgery and finished it on my way to healing. And it's been a great process. It was a lot of fun. And I, you know, I don't think I've done, I've done probably 10 records at this point. Um, I get to do all kinds of different stuff like that, but it's all music based and it's all, you know, in what I like to do. And like I said, I'm pretty lucky that I get to do all this stuff, you know, and I know it. I'm great, grateful, totally grateful. Obviously you're not slowing down, but is there a sense in which, you know, having a family and having a kids like mellows you out to a certain extent? Yeah, totally. I mean, it, it definitely, it, it may, it mellows you out. It you know, makes you contemplate what's really important, you know, about all this that I do. In fact, I think I hear one of them now. Hold on one second. Howdy. Hi. Did you guys... I'm doing, a, I'm doing an interview. How did you do? <laughs> That's Ryan. Well, stupid ain't you stupid. Well, stupid ain't you kind. Sanity won't know you in this life. Well, there you go. There's that. That pretty much tells the story of that whole question right there, right? I've been, I stopped drinking about three, well, I guess four years ago this month. Um, and mm-hmm. I, she, she said you've been to sober for about a year now? I've been sober for 15 months now. Wait, today's the 16th. Yeah. 15 months today. <laughs> Does it does it get any easier? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I was ready to stop because I'd done it for so long. When I went into rehab, I just kind of, you know, I tried. I basically tried it on my own a couple of times, and with you know, lack of knowledge and else other things kind of going on, I didn't. I wasn't really good at it. But when I finally did, um, I came out of rehab, and I, I haven't thought about it. Haven't had. I haven't even craved it. I still have my lunch at the bar pretty much a few times a week um, with friends and sit at the bar. I don't, it hasn't uh, infiltrated my thoughts in that way like it, like it used to. And like, I think I just got, you know, one lucky at the same time that I was ready to stop. And, you know, um, I never say never because I'm not going to be foolish enough to say, ah, I'm I'm healed and it's all that um you know like they say one day at a time today I'm not drinking so I kind of stick with the program with that you know and did something come along to make you like full stop want to stop or was it just sort of gradual over time you know my friends a- approached me about it they were worried about me you know I I wasn't being coy about my doctor you know saying that you know my liver enzymes are a little bit a little bit much uh and that you know, check, I should check into not drinking anymore, um, which I, you know, I didn't really listen to. And so my friends were kind of, you know, kind of hooked me up and said, yeah, we think you'd probably time you sober up. And I was like, you know what? Give me a week. I'm finishing a thing over here and I'll sew up my, my fares and I'll go do it. And I did it. And, um, and, uh, I'm grateful for all of it. And, I'm loving sober life, you know. I got a lot yet, and I'm not even close. I mean, 15 months out of 40 years, you know, you do the math. You know the, you know the drill. You've been sober enough to know the drill. Um, I got a lot of work to do still. Um, a lot of those, uh, a lot of the basic things within the AA tenets uh, are very, you can take the God part out of it. They're just very like life 101, really. I mean, when I read it and look into it, it's like, shit, I wish I'd, I wish they'd 
incorporated that in the school when I was there because, you know, I think a lot of us um, would have benefited from that kind of experience in school growing up when we don't have, you know, parents, you know, uh, teaching us these kind of things. I grew up pretty much, I, when I look back, I pretty much grew up with no guardrails as a kid. I mean, I got in trouble early, was in trouble because my mom was always working at the bar selling drinks and you know it was just kind of kind of a crap way to grow up really but there are so many people out there that grow up the same way if it were ever possible to have take the aa and the god part out of the book and teach that to kids growing up i think we'd have a whole just in general a better uh, a better society of people yeah i mean i think that that's kind of the key to to growing up is questioning certain like core beliefs that you held on to or just took for granted your, your entire life. Yeah, totally. Totally. I think, I think that's, that's a way of sewing that up. Whoa.